On November 23rd of 2015, a 42nd Street shuttle train in New York City was decked out in symbols of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. This wasn't an act of vandalism, though, but rather an ad campaign to promote the season one finale of Amazon's newest show, Man in the High Castle, based on the 1962 Philip K. Dick novel of the same name, in which the Allied powers have lost the war and the U.S. is colonized by Imperial Japan on the west and the Reich on the east. The ads were taken down a few days later after de Blasio and Cuomo pressured the MTA to do so, as the government agency initially didn't want to, stating, The MTA can't accept or reject ads based on how we feel about them. We have to follow the standards approved by our board. This advertising, whether you find it distasteful or not, obviously isn't advertising Nazism. It's advertising a TV show. Basically, the MTA doesn't care about your feelings. Other ad campaigns would feature the Statue of Liberty doing the Hitler salute, which is not in the show, by the way, and it wasn't pulled because at that point, someone was already the president-elect. But in November of 2015, after that someone announced his presidential bid, most Americans still felt that fascism and the rise of Nazism couldn't happen here. At the time, many people felt like the MTA did, who in their right mind would see these ads and think, cool, these images align with my political beliefs. But after the quiet part was said all too loudly, Man in the High Castle, along with other alternate reality and speculative fiction TV shows like The Handmaid's Tale, were there to give us a sort of mirror to look into and think about who we really were, what we've always been, and what we could become. But did Man in the High Castle do a good job? Did they delve into the deep questions? Did they create compelling characters and arguments? Did they justify their very much intended to be offensive ad campaign? And lastly, how does the show even end? How does it end? John, all of this, I mean, where does it end? Well, let's take a look and spoilers for the entire series. Taco, don't, 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 please. To understand my commentary on Man in the High Castle, you first need to understand the world of the show. As stated, the premise of the series is that the U.S. no longer exists and hasn't for around 20 years, as the show takes place in the early or mid-60s, and the country is instead split up into three main areas. There's the Japanese Pacific States on the west, the Greater Reich on the east, and the neutral zone in the middle, a lawless buffer zone where those who can't exist in either area go to survive. Though a lot of the advertising focused heavily on New York City, the capital of the Greater Reich, the majority of the show actually takes place in San Francisco or the capital of the Japanese Pacific States, since in the Pacific States, things are more free than the Reich. For example, the Japanese haven't wiped out minority populations, but instead have just made everyone who isn't Japanese, including Japanese Americans, second-class citizens. The Japanese are also weaker than the Nazis in that they're not as technologically advanced. For example, they don't have atomic weapons, while the Nazis won the war in the U.S. by dropping an A-bomb on D.C. The Japanese also don't have the high-speed bullet trains and airplane jets that the Reich does, nor do they have their superior surveillance equipment. Therefore, the resistance is much stronger in the West Coast, and since most of the characters are part of the resistance, that's naturally where most of the show takes place. As for the American Reich, it's just non-Jewish white Americans, and of course, non-Jewish white Germans. And this brings me to my first really big gripe with the show. In the book, the Greater Reich isn't whites only. In fact, it's clearly stated that the Axis powers have enslaved the black U.S. population, and there's even talk about a slave trade between the South, which is its own region in the book that's controlled by Nazis, and San Francisco. So black characters exist on both sides. But in the show, they've all but been eliminated in the Reich, and the black resistance group and characters only exist from the Rocky Mountains onward. And therefore, in the show, the Black Communist Rebellion, a faction of the wider resistance, only ever comes face to face with the Japanese. Isn't it convenient that the white characters and therefore the white audience, mainly boomer white men, let's be honest, 
never have to be confronted with the racial violence that they inflict on black people in our world today. The only one altercation in all 40 hours of the show between a black character and the Nazis is with Fatima Hassan and a sympathetic Nazi named John Smith, who we'll get to later, who helps Fatima cover up after she wakes up from forcibly being put into a coma. She's able to free herself via meditation and teletransports to another world, which yes, we'll get to, but that's really it when it comes to Nazi and black confrontations. There's a threat of the Reich bombing San Fran and therefore the BCR in the series finale, but the good white American guy pulls the plug. I think it's good that the show doesn't show a lot of violence that the Reich inflicted, but I also hate how the showrunners, script writers, and producers intentionally made sure via world building that the Nazis aren't shown doing anything too egregious to Jewish and black characters, and more importantly, intentionally built a world where black and Jewish rebels can't be shown fighting back against their white fascist oppressors. And because of this, most if not all of the characters that suffer in the Reich are white and non-Jewish, and are all also active in the Nazi party to, I guess, make us feel conflicted about them. For example, there's the character of Nicole Dormer, a young Nazi woman who is also a Liebensborn. The Liebensborn program was, to put it fairly crudely, a breeding program to perfect the Aryan race. It did actually exist, and support groups for the victims of the program were created in order to help people cope with their trauma. In the show, the Liebensborn are special, and Nicole revels in it. She is also part of the, let's say, liberal or hippie Nazi movement. In Berlin, there's a young group of next generation Nazis who tout free love and environmentalism and also do drugs. In season two, when Nicole is introduced, she says that they just need to wait out for the old generation to die and things will be better, a very privileged way of thinking. In season three of the show, she wants to become the next Lenny Riefenstahl and we see what she meant by better, which is basically just making the youth more violent and more conservative through her films and Yarn Null or Year Zero initiative to invigorate young Nazi America. So much for liberal Nazis, but honestly, I'm so glad they got rid of that plot that was ridiculous. Nicole is also bisexual and knows that her identity is not accepted, but also doesn't really care because of her Liebensborn status and Aryanhood and dedication to the party. She never reflects on those who have suffered because of what she's taken part in and benefited from, or that one day she too could be prosecuted. Some people saw Nicole's character as the show's commentary on the hypocrisy of Nazis of marginalized identities, while others saw it as a cautionary tale directed to actual real-life LGBTQ plus alt-right writers who are supposedly watching this show, maybe. I personally found it kind of gross that the show frames the lesbian and bi Nazi women characters not as characters, but as moral dilemmas for the audience, like, you hate Nazis, but you don't hate bi and lesbian Nazis, right? I get that the point of the show is to make us feel sympathetic towards Nazis and to make you aware that Nazis are more complicated than you think and aren't a monolith, but that's another one of my big gripes with the show that we'll delve into later. In the end, they take Nicole and her girlfriend away and we never see them again. The show does this very annoying thing where it tackles different minorities every season and it just feels very tokenizing. Season one focuses on the Jewish characters being prosecuted, season two focuses on the Japanese American, season three focuses on lesbian, gay, and bisexual characters, and season four focuses on the black characters. But it just always either feels rushed, out of nowhere, or the characters that actually have interesting identities get one season and then disappear or die. I know that Amazon pulled the plug early on this show, but it seemed like they didn't really know where the show was going to begin with. As for the Jewish characters on the show, due to the strange world building, they only exist in the Pacific states and the neutral zone. We never see any altercations with Jewish people and Nazis, only one time in a flashback in which the sympathetic Nazi John Smith feels bad about sending his Jewish friend Daniel Levine away to a concentration camp. In the end, the world building makes the Japanese characters the main perpetrators when it comes to 
Jewish people and people of color, whereas the Nazis in their all-white bubble are more concerned with eating each other. As Noah Berlatsky wrote in their article, Amazon's Man in the High Castle is a missed opportunity to discuss homegrown fascism, the narrative becomes about how much more racist a foreign non-white government is rather than about how white people in America have always behaved. This leaning towards having the Japanese be the main antagonist against the American characters feels a lot to me like when Universal asked Mel Brooks to change springtime for Hitler to springtime for Mussolini. Nazis being bad guys to racial and religious minorities is just too real, so let's give that job to the Japanese. In fact, this Reddit post, which was published during the beginning of the show, illustrated how the framing of the world worked to the Nazis' benefit. Some people ended up seeing the Japanese as worse because everything's a competition, and also because they're not white and are shown doing more violence, at least on screen, than the Nazis are. Comments actually did call out the post for being racist, which was nice, but god did the show do a good job at shielding Nazis from doing bad things 75% of the time. And this isn't to say that the Japanese aren't of course guilty of their own war crimes, numerous ones in real life and in the show, but that in the show, the Reich and therefore the white characters get off too easy. We hear and see the raw numbers of people that they've killed, but we never really truly feel the weight of it. One, because it's rushed and only in the final season. Two, only shown to further a white woman's character growth. And three, we never see rebellions in Reich territory by the black and Jewish people they've tried to oppress. The Japanese, of course, also get their own nuanced storylines and aren't just, like, all evil. A favorite character of mine and an overall fan favorite is Tagomi, who fights for peace as trade minister for the entire show, risking his life to do so. But his character also plays into the Asian stereotype of Asian people and mysticism. As Lin King wrote for the Princeton Buffer in 2015, Tagomi also repeatedly bases many of his political decisions on the I Ching, an ancient form of Chinese divination that would hardly have acted as a major tactical influence on a Cold War era politician. But alas, how on earth will people find the plot believable if the Asians started relying on political theory instead of mysticism? As the series ends, Juliana, a white woman and also one of the main characters of the show, also gets involved with the I Ching and of course understands it better than most. The same thing happens with her and the Japanese art of Aikido. As King writes, in the ensuing scene we meet Juliana at Aikido practice, where we learn that she excels at the Japanese martial art far more than a room full of Asian men twice her age, because of course she does. There's a big lack of Asian American resistance fighters, specifically Chinese Americans, and like, did the show writers forget that this is San Francisco? And the Chinese are treated like second class citizens by the Japanese in the book, and also in real history, so it was weird how that wasn't brought up at all. So that's the overall world of the show, and it's not necessarily like the worst thing in the world, but it does make me very angry and cynical. But now that you understand the world, I can now talk about things that I found noteworthy about the series. Some are themes, some are characters, and the last point is about the fandom and the shift in the political commentary after the show was hijacked by SJWs in season 3. So here are my points in a numbered list. So at the end of season one, Tagomi brings himself to an alt world where the good guys live or where the US has won the war. I was waiting for someone to be racist to Tagomi as he's a random Japanese man who just appears out of nowhere and lands in the US, but no one bats an eye. Whereas in the novel, Tagomi is met with the simmering racist antipathy of the world in which America won the war. Watch it, Tojo, one man says to him. In the book, this is done to show that our world and the world of the greater Nazi Reich aren't so different after all, that racism and bigotry still exist in our world, but the television series almost never addresses that. It's not until season 4 that we see how black people are treated by the police in both worlds, that we physically observe that maybe the world ruled by the Nazi Reich isn't that different from our own. Before this, we hear about the mans in our concentration camp and Japanese Americans, as well as see Tagomi react to how in this good world, the US dropped two A-bombs on his home country, but that's seen more as a necessarily evil than anything else. Even Juliana, the main good guy and resistance fighter, kind of glances over the fact that we dropped two atomic bombs on Japan in this 
better world. There's no talk about how the U.S.'s eugenic policies influenced the Nazis, how Jewish people were treated by the U.S. when seeking asylum during World War II and before, and it's just very disappointing how they only start to dig into this theme in the last season. The characters in the world of the Greater Nazi Reich and Japanese Pacific States have doppelgangers in the alt world, but of course they're all good. Tagomi does have a harder backstory as his alt self is an angry father, but he resolves that nicely. Sympathetic Nazi John Smith's alt self does talk about how he might have been corrupted, but was able to control his temptations. And there's no inklings that alt Smith holds any racial biases at all. He stands up for MLK's speech, the alt him would have helped the black couple that was forced out of the diner, as his son Thomas says, and in all, he's a good guy in the alt world, and that's where the story really misses the mark. As Noah Berlatsky writes, this lack of real introspection is a missed opportunity. The man in the high castle could have used the two John Smiths to show that white men who tolerate fascism thrive in our world already. You don't need to create an alternate Nazi universe to find them. Instead, it suggests that Nazi Smith is the product of an entire alien ideology, one imposed on America rather than one with roots here too. How can the show ever hope to hold up a mirror to the white audience in the room if the one character that actually gets a fleshed out arc in the show, ironically a US soldier turned Nazi, was never racist or bigoted to begin with in either of his lives, and when dropping the bombs was just a necessary evil? The problem is that the worlds in which the Allies have won the war are never seen as bad by any of the characters who travel there, those being Juliana, Tagomi, and Smith. It's not until the last season of the show that the Black Communist Rebellion finally addresses that the US as we know it is just as bad as the world that they already live in. They even say, fuck the American flag, and honestly, good for the show. They ended up losing a lot of fans after that, um, which we're going to talk about later, but I'm glad that they finally said it. Season 4 saved the show for me, honestly, for finally asking some of the bigger questions and for getting to the freaking point already, but unfortunately, it took way too long. In season 1, we see a film in which the Allied powers have won the war, and it's Juliana's mission to show the film to as many people as possible because she thinks that this film will give people hope. Not to mention that this world really does exist, so if it exists there, why can't it exist here? Um, I don't know, maybe because there are two different timelines and universes and circumstances? In the end, the film does inspire the greater resistance and others to rise up, but the film ends up not being that important in the last season and the series finale, as what inspires the BCR is the will to be free not some film of a timeline where they'd still be second-class citizens. The only people who want to return to how things were before the war or go to this alternate reality where the Allies have won the war are white people, and that part of the show, though addressed in the final hours of the series, should have been addressed a long time ago. You really have to suspend your disbelief that these films would change anyone's mind, and of course to also believe that universe hopping and teletransportation through portals and meditation is a thing. And yeah, sometimes even I don't buy it. Yeah, well not this one, man. Season 2 introduces us to Asian American characters, but really only Japanese American characters. We see that in Tagomi's other life, his wife is still alive along with his son, but they don't like him or trust him because of the violent outbursts of his alt self. However, he soon makes amends with them and we get some interesting takes about what it means to be Japanese American and how even though Tagomi's son was born in Japan, he's American now and calls the US his home. I personally found that to be pretty powerful and really like how Tagomi needs to wrestle with that. But the Japanese American characters in the dystopic world or the main timeline of the show leave much to be desired. Sarah Murakami is a resistance fighter who doesn't hate anyone. She later meets Frank, a Jewish American who lost his sister and her children to the Kempei Tai or the Japanese military police. Frank in the show is Jewish through his grandfather, but Frank initially isn't very religious, but becomes more so as the show goes on, even having a bar mitzvah. The Kempei Tai know that Frank is Jewish and he faces a double whammy in the new society because he's also white. The Japanese treat him like shit and it's truly awful what they do to his family. One day, Frank and Sarah are working on a mission together and Frank is spat upon by a Japanese soldier and then remarks to Sarah, you don't know what it's like to be seen as less than. You don't know what it is to be treated like a piece of shit every minute 
of every day because of what you look like. It's the worst writing. Like, you really couldn't think of a better segue into this. Frank, of course, says this because in their current reality, Sarah can pass as a Japanese person, even though Japanese Americans are still seen as less than. Plus, Frank was brought up in a world where the Japanese people reign supreme, so he doesn't get how Japanese Americans were once less than too, but it's annoying as an audience member still. Anyway, Sarah explains that before the Japanese occupation, it was white guys like Frank who looked down on her for being Asian and more specifically Japanese. And then Frank goes, not to this white guy. Yeah, well, not this white man. I almost stopped watching the show after that. We all hold racial biases and prejudices, but not Frank, apparently. Like, why do they do this? It's just so freaking cringy. <laughs> then Sarah educates him about Manzanar, a concentration camp she was sent to with her family by U.S. soldiers. And then she dies, and honestly, even after meeting her, Frank doesn't really change his view on Japanese Americans because he never meets one again. And everyone treats their one-night stand as if Frank has, like, an Asian fetish, and it's like... Ew. I don't know if that's supposed to be realistic or not, but like sometimes people throw in racism in shows to be more realistic, but it just comes off as annoying. There's a half white and half Japanese character named Nakamura who wants to prove to Kido, his boss, that white culture question mark is just as powerful as Japanese culture. I don't know, it's weird and forgettable, and like most Asian American characters on the show, he dies within a few episodes. Lastly, there's Children, who dresses up white sex workers like this, and he fetishizes Japanese culture, and who later gets rewarded with a Japanese wife, and it's like, please take this show away from me. So let's talk about the Nazi characters. Firstly, there's John Smith, who's the best character in the show. That's not such a great thing, though, which I'll explain why later. But first, who is John Smith? Smith starts out as a U.S. Army officer and has a wife named Helen and three children, Thomas, who is born at the beginning of the occupation, and later Jennifer and Amy. He and Helen see the Nazis drop the A-bomb on DC and are given an ultimatum, join them or be killed, so of course they join them. He helps his Jewish friend Daniel escape, who's also in the military, but later after joining the Nazis, he's forced to send him to a concentration camp. Years pass and John is living with his family and he and his wife have convinced themselves that everything they've done is just to keep their family safe and they're not actually evil, they just don't have a choice. And this entire thing hinges on the fairly ludicrous idea that the Smiths are 100% perfect, they're 100% good before the war and even during the occupation, they don't have any biases towards anyone, they're not necessarily racist or anti-semitic, they were just made evil. And this theme of evil runs throughout the show. Are people evil because of an ideology? Is it because there's a gun to your head? Is it because evil is actually banal and so mind-pending that it can't truly be fathomed? Well, most of the Smith's arc focuses on the fact that they had no choice and are just doing what they have to do to survive, but that's also extremely boring. <laughs> Characters in fiction need to have choices and motivations, and when it's just, gun to your head, would you be a Nazi? <laughs> That's just not very interesting. It would have been cool to see U.S. soldiers who were sympathetic to the Nazi cause and happy when they took over, and characters who were motivated by an ideology, as that's how it kind of works in the real world. But we never get that level of nuance. Instead, the Nazis are motivated by not wanting to die themselves, and again, that's just boring. Some of the most interesting characters in the Reich and the Japanese Pacific states are the ones who actually make choices that have larger consequences and are characters that are motivated by more than just, if I don't do X, Y, or Z, I'm toast. So before we delve too deeply into John Smith's character and why he's the best character in the show, let's talk about some other Nazi characters. Firstly, there's Heusmann, a German Nazi who ends up taking over after Hitler dies and is motivated by his beliefs rather than a gun-to-your-head scenario. He believes that nuking Japan and the Pacific states and killing millions is worth it because this will be the last war and that's horrific, but that's also fascinating. Conversely, Joe, his son, is the worst character on the show. Firstly, he has no motivation. His slogan is something to the effect of, 
I understand loyalty to a person, not a cause, aka I'm not political, and it's like, fuck off then, like why are you even in this show? What made me really hate Joe though is that at first he doesn't really want to be involved with Hoisman because his mom told him that his dad was a bad person and didn't want him. But then it turns out that his dad did want him and that his mom lied to him and then Joe was all like, I love you dad, and it's like, He's a fucking Nazi, though. Like, there's no reflection about how his mom was actually right about his dad at all. I know the point is to make Nazis more complicated, but like, no, don't do that, though. I miss the days when we could just, you know, depict Nazis as bad people, rather than actually take them seriously, because then it gives their beliefs more validity, and that's dangerous. And the series only seems to get that in the last season of the show. So going back to the Smiths, they have a son named Thomas who has a form of muscular dystrophy, which will end up with him being paralyzed. Don and Helen realize that they just can't blend in anymore or live life as normally as possible under the Reich because now it's affecting them. I thought this was a really contrived plot point, but you know, I get it. They want to enforce the theme of first they came, but it's just so grating. Like, now that it's affecting me, I care, is so cliche and doesn't make me sympathetic with them at all. If anything, it just makes me hate them even more. John hatches a plan to pretend that Thomas got kidnapped, but then Thomas turns himself in, and it's a really sad scene, and one theme that they really try to home in on here is that of brainwashing. It comes up again with his sister saying that Thomas's mind was poisoned by propaganda, but I hate this idea that the kids and the adults are just like brainwashed. Like why can't they actually believe in a cause or in an ideology? Like actually believe it. The show never wants any of the characters to take the blame for holding up or acting on their beliefs. Rather, they're just brainwashed or have a gun to their head. And it's like, then what's the fucking point? They also make Alt Thomas brainwashed by propaganda when he joins the Marines in the alt world. And it's like, why can't he just join the Marines? Some people just want to join the Marines and it's not because they're mindless or are being controlled. It's because they believe that the military is a good thing. Like, it's okay for characters and people to have beliefs and also act on them. I get that sometimes choices aren't really choices, but to also take away agency by chalking it up to brainwashing as if we can just undo beliefs and instill beliefs at will is just sort of annoying and extremely reductive as to how things work in the real world that the show so much wants to comment on. Anyway, Thomas dies and it's terrible but I felt no sympathy for Helen or John even after that. They were my least favorite characters for a long time and Helen kind of stayed on the list, but John was able to get off of it and actually be a little interesting. Now for why John is the best character of the show. Later in the series, John is promoted, but also has his party loyalty questioned as Helen and his two daughters ran away to the neutral zone for a while and the plot to fake kidnap his son was also found out. Not to mention that he also hid the diagnosis from the state. This leads to a debate on whether the white Americans who are living in the Greater Reich are Aryan enough, and thus white Americans seem to be the Reich's next target, which is a great idea by the way, but only brought up in the final season of the show. Meanwhile, John has his assistant spy on his alt self, who's happily married to Helen, and where Thomas is still alive and isn't disabled and goes off to join the Marines. We get to know Alt John as a good guy. He cares about Martin Luther King and when presented with real military power, he decides not to pursue it because he realized that he didn't like himself when he had it. And I feel like uh, if I'd stayed, then that job would have, would have grown into me. Therefore, for Smith, power reveals who he truly is and that was a genius move. Evil in the show is given many motivations. Smith's motivation for most of the series is that there's a gun to his head essentially. But the idea that power reveals what John was all along is just so satisfying. For most of the show, he was a good guy. He did what he did for his family, but in reality, he did it for himself and his own ego. And none of that is more obvious than when he becomes the Fuhrer of the US to the now independent American Reich. 
He then goes with Helen to try to bring Alt Thomas to their world, but Helen says that she'd never want that and says that she and John don't deserve to have children. And finally, like finally someone said that. The resistance blows up the train and Helen dies and John dies by suicide. Never being able to bring Alt Thomas to this horrible dystopia and the show should have ended there. Instead it goes on and we see the portal people and it's like, Alrighty then. In all, the Smiths are the main characters, and John is the best character because he's the only one with real motivations who stays with us from start to finish. But it's kind of sad to realize that the reason why John is the best written character in the show is because he's white and non-Jewish, a no-strings-attached character. The writers are clearly better at writing what they're used to, white men, and it's just so ironically depressing that the Nazi gets the best story. And I know people are gonna comment, you know, that's the point, but that's a really sad point and shouldn't have been the point of the story. So white women have always been active members and beneficiaries of white supremacy. Of course, as women, they face sexism within their white spheres, but they're also privileged due to their whiteness, their womanhood, and their perceived innocence. In short, white women get away with shit. They are able to hide behind the sexist notion that women are just mindless sheep and that women are more morally superior and less corrupt than men are when that's not true. Women can be just as evil and hateful and conniving as men are, but white women have been able to kind of escape not talking about their hand in racism until recently because they were able to be shielded by this infantilizing idea that women can't and don't think for themselves. And this isn't just prevalent to how white women act in the real world, but also when writers create white women characters. And for the most part, the white women in The Man in the High Castle are just annoying, I'm just gonna say it. Firstly, there's Juliana, and she's written to be better at Aikido, for one, the plot so she can overpower characters, and two, because white people love imagining that they're amazing at East Asian martial arts for some reason. Juliana can't be racist in either timeline, of course, because she's married to Tagomi's son, and she's just so pure and good, she doesn't even believe Joe is a Nazi until season three, and it's like it took you long enough. <sighs> Juliana constantly gives Joe the benefit of the doubt, even after she sees that he's a freaking Nazi, because she sees the good in him, and it's like, ew. Next, there's Lucy Collins, who is a white Nazi housewife like Helen, but who can't have children. This is nerve-wracking for her because of the way the Reich essentializes women's bodies. We feel bad for her, but I personally don't really care for her. She spreads a lot of hateful rumors and gossips about people's features, and is specifically anti-Semitic. Like, stop trying to make me feel bad for white women who are also Nazis. And this brings me to my other big gripe with the show, making Nazis sympathetic. The series preys on this idea that the white characters in the show could be you, and that's why you should care about the rise of fascism. And disregarding the fact that this only works if you're a white audience member, it's just very cynical. The show doesn't trust the white audience to be able to know that they shouldn't like fascism and Nazis because it's fucking fascism and Nazis. So they have to shoehorn in these white sympathetic Nazi characters rather than focusing on the non-white and Jewish characters, and it's just such a waste of time. In the real world, there are white people of all identities that are sympathetic to the Nazi cause and are pro-fascism. So no, having sympathetic Nazi characters doesn't resonate or make me feel bad or even work as like a cautionary tale. <sighs> Lastly, there's Helen Smith and her daughters. Helen, in typical white woman fashion, didn't know the specifics about the camps, didn't really know how many people they killed, but when she finds out, she's horrified and it's like, come on. <laughs> I know they're playing into this, you know, housewife doesn't know shit thing, and there of course was a form of sexism in the Reich, and I bet, you know, a shielding of the truth. But at the same time, it's like, really Helen, stop with the fucking act. Helen's discovery of the truth is just so lame, but thankfully her ignorance doesn't absolve her of anything. And she's rightfully called out by her daughter Jennifer, who hates Nazi America, for just being a terrible person who only cared about their family and their family alone. Helen tries to come up with a reason about why she just kept her head down and stayed ignorant, but in the end, evil is banal and therefore truly incomprehensible. 
Helen has no ideology. She's never outwardly racist or anti-Semitic or ableist. She was just going with the flow, and though realistic, is totally uninteresting. One of the reasons why The Handmaid's Tale is better, in my opinion, than Man in the High Castle is because it gives the villains, specifically the white women villains, an ideology and concrete beliefs. Serena, for example, believes in the Bible. She's not brainwashed. She's an intellectual with actual ideas. Serena might waver here or there, but she's complex in her belief system. But Helen is just the typical I-didn't-know white woman character and it's like, then what's the point then? Amy, Helen's youngest daughter, is fully into Nazi ideology. She's a little curious about where the black people and Jewish people went, but never finds out. If anything, she's just more excited to tell on her parents or call out people for not following party rules. I personally liked her character because she had real convictions, unlike the other white main characters who didn't know what they were doing until it was too late. <coughs> How does it end? John, all of this, I mean, where does it end? I don't know if this is the worst fandom, but it's definitely not the best fandom either. One of the things I was most curious about after watching the show was the fandom discourse surrounding it, as the show itself is very political and came out at a very divisive time in US history, and in the end, it's not very good. In fact, a lot of the fans of the show ended up leaving after season 3 because of the liberal PC agenda. <laughs> Let me explain. The first two seasons, more than the last two seasons, heavily promoted the aesthetics of Nazism and that this is a both sides issue. In an interview with Vulture, Issa Dick Hackett, an executive producer of the show in 2016, said, I like to think that there's a conversation that can be had that will be helpful in some way on both ends. As if fascism and Nazism is a both sides issue, as if you can make a show where Nazis are sympathetic. Fascism isn't an opinion, being a Nazi isn't an opinion, and fascism isn't up for debate. One of the most annoying things about season 2 of the show is that they made the resistance go too far and thank god they retconned that in season 4, but like really? The resistance fighting the Nazis are just as bad as Nazis? Fuck off. It's obvious that the show was made initially for white conservative Americans and for them to see themselves in the characters as the main cast for the most part is mostly white and because it's the white characters who have to realize the weight of their actions and who Nazism usually appeals to. <laughs> in the end, Helen and John are the main characters. Kido is too sure, but his plot with his son and how he affected him, though done well, comes in too late. The show always seemed to be more concerned with its bureaucrats than the resistance, and though BCR leader Belle Mallory is a good character, she enters the series as its ending. The first two seasons got higher reviews from fans, in which there is little or no mention of black or LGBTQ plus characters. Seasons 3 and 4, which introduced characters who are black or LGBTQ+, were panned by fans and got less viewership, and I wonder if there's a correlation there. While reading the Man in the High Castle Reddit, some IMDb posts, and some Amazon reviews, it became extremely clear to me why the show did the things they did, and that is because the fan base was extremely toxic. Not all the fans, of course, but I'd say a good number of them. Thankfully, the last season of the show said no more both sides, and they decided to go full steam ahead with having the Black Communist Rebellion be heroes and disavow our current state of the union. But the amount of backlash that the Black characters faced, along with the PC agenda of having four gay, bi, and lesbian characters, was disgusting. I know I said in the beginning of this video that I found Nicole to be a little grating and not written that well, and though she's not written that well, I am still glad that she was in the show and I think that it's good that she exists. But as per usual, the actress who played her was treated disgustingly on online forums. When season 3 premiered and it was revealed that her character was bi, the news was received with anger and hostility and accusations about furthering the agenda. Many of the fans tuned out for seasons 3 and 4 because of homophobia and biphobia and racism against the black characters, and that just really sucks. DJ Qualls, who plays Ed, who's gay in the show, came out in 2020 after the show ended, and honestly, good for him, but god did his character get backlash. 
a lot of people were able to suspend their disbelief that people could teleport via their minds in meditation, but having gay characters kiss in the open is just anachronistic. To me, it's really telling that a show that was supposed to confront people's biases ended up just enforcing what they already believed. That having gay or bi characters or black characters on a show is just a waste of time and derails from the plot. After learning more about the fan base, it made me understand why the show was crafted the way it was, why there was so little black characters and no out LGBTQ plus characters for the first two seasons. It was because they were trying to get people on board for when things were going to get deeper, but instead white and homophobic fans saw it as a slap in the face and it just made them angry. My sociology professor, who I already made a video about on this channel, went on a pro-Trump travel ban rant in 2017, back when the second season of this show was coming out, saying that America finally got its balls back and that those people hate us, so why should we open our borders to them? That day in class, like, haunts me to this day. And it's people like that who the show seemed to appeal to and pander to, until it actually stood for something. In this video, I talked about Man in the High Castle, a very confusing show with a lot of mixed messages, but that still was able to give us a somewhat satisfying conclusion, aside from the portal people. Who are you people? Though not disrupting things we already knew about ourselves and focusing too much on the blandness of the white characters, the show ends on a somewhat radical note by painting the black communist rebellion in a positive light. And finally has the gall to renounce the US as we know it, and it was brave enough to alienate their main fan demographic, and for that, I think it deserves a small, small pat on the back. All right, everyone, that's it for this video. Please let me know if you liked it down in the comments below, what your thoughts on Man in the High Castle were or are, or if you're watching it now. And yeah, I hope you liked it. I had fun filming it and just ranting about how I felt about it. So yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much to my members and patrons. And I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.